Welcome again to the Academy on Computers. This time, computer music and speech. We'll be looking at some new technological developments and exploring the making of computer music with three studio guests. To get us started on the right notes, our resident expert, Jim Butterfield. Jim? So tonight you'd like to be to give you some sound advice. A sound <laughs> advice, yes, yep. Jim. Especially in the area of speech, because that fascinates me more even more than computer music. Mm -hmm. What can you tell me about computer speech? Okay, well, this is called speech synthesis. And in order to make the computer talk, we have to make up the same sort of electronic vibrations as we do when we're making music, but they follow a somewhat different style. Most computers are capable of performing speech, but they need extra hardware added. It's usually not built in. And so we have devices called speech synthesizers. I have one here, for example, Jack. This is a speech synthesizer which receives its input on the connection from the computer, the words and information to be spoken come in on this connector on the side, and then this is processed in there, the information is recognized, and the sound signals end up as speech coming out of the machine. Right, but how does it generate the speech? Well, there are two basic methods. One is called the word recognition principle, and that means we can send full words with our usual horrible English spelling down to the synthesizer, and it will recognize them, decode them, and speak the correct word. And the other one is called phonemes, in which we break down each word into its individual sound components, and we send these sound components down to the speech synthesizer. Which is the most common method of those two? Well, the most common one is the uh, word recognition. This is much easier because then you can send down words from a document and you don't have to translate them into phonemes that will all happen in here. This, for example, is the Texas Instrument Speech Synthesizer. It has a vocabulary of about 300 words. Now, that doesn't sound like very much, but that's a fair amount of unusual spellings of words and the rest we can usually make up by other systems of putting the various letters together and more or less electronically guessing how to speak it. How would I know uh, which words were programmed in? Well, usually you'll find that in the instruction manual. What you have to do is to take a look in the book, and it will say, here are the words we have, and here are the ones that don't exist here. So you have an example of the speech synthesizer in action. Uh, the, what I've done is I've typed in a, the first line of a well-known poem, The Sun Was Shining on the Sea, Shining with all its might. Now, I type that in with its normal English spelling, right. and when I press the enter key to put it into the computer, it will be transmitted to the speech synthesizer, and it will say it. Here we go. Now, you can see the advantage of having something that recognizes spelling. M-I-G-H-T mm -hmm. is a rather unusual spelling when you think about it, and if we simply had an idiot piece of electronics that didn't understand about recognizing these words out of the vocabulary, then it might say the individual letters and end up saying something like MIGHUT, which doesn't sound very good. So this is the word recognition method. This right? is the word okay. recognition method. I couldn't just speak the words into the computer and get that reaction. No, what we're talking about in that case is speech recognition, and that's a much more difficult situation on a small computer. It really isn't perfected yet, and computers can only recognize quite limited vocabulary and somewhat poorly. Uh, in fact, we also have the difficulty with spellings. If, for example, you were to say something like, uh, okay, you say, I'm going to take the plane, mm -hmm. and we won't know if it's just a computer listening, whether you're in a donut shop and say you don't want one with chocolate, or whether you don't want to travel by rail or car, you want to fly today. The computer doesn't know, of course, because it has no way of knowing which plane you happen to mean there. So, speech recognition isn't very advanced at the moment. Jim, do you have any programs that use computer speech? Yes, I have an educational program here, which is called Early Reading, and I'd like to show this on the same computer. First, I'll have to turn it off, and we'll have to take out the old program, plug in the new one, turn things on again, and then we'll have to press any key to start, and press section number two. Here we go. Okay, now we have here... Press one, four, six, eight, picture. Press two, four, six, eight, word. Press three, four, make, eight, story. Yes, I mustn't interrupt the computer. <laughs> we have here uh, an example of a program for children who are just learning to read, and these are a number of graded programs. 
We'll pick number one, pick a picture, and we'll see what happens hey, here. Hey, picture. And now we'll be given a series of nine possible pictures that we can pick, and we'll hear a story. Number of that picture. Well, okay. Let's number two, the duck. You like the duck. Right. Okay, let's Better. select number two, the duck. The name of the story is the monkey and the duck. Right. And the words appear there with the voice. Here are That's correct. some words that will help you read the story. This is a monkey. This word is monkey. All right, Jim, I, I'm just going to turn that down for a minute. I, I can see where this would be very useful for youngsters learning to read. Are there any other applications of, of the speech? Yes, there are a number of cases where a computer that speaks can be quite useful to you. For example, suppose you're drawing things up on a big chart somewhere. Mm -hmm. Then, if you're putting this thing up on the chart, you don't always want to be looking at your computer screen and reading things off. It would, it would be very nice if your computer would call and call the values out to you. You can just mark them up on the chart or the computer calls them up. That could be useful. Let's take another situation. Suppose we are telephoning into a computer for some information from a conventional telephone, perhaps by using the touchstone pad to signal what we want. The computer, if it can speak back, can tell us directly the information we have, the stock market quotation or the cost of the article or a confirmation of the order. This can be very useful, too. And then certain types of handicaps find a speech synthesis device very useful. For example, people who are blind find it very useful to have a computer that can speak to them and can read things off the screen for them. Now, the other side of the coin is, of course, if you aren't able to speak, then you can use a computer to speak for you. So it has a number of possible speech uses. Speech synthesis then has a lot of applications and probably a terrific future. Uh, yes, and in fact, as the cost of this technology goes down and the sounds that come out of it get better and better, I think we'll see a great deal of it in the future. In fact, there's another aspect of uh, speech synthesis that I'd like to show you, and that is it's entering into the realm of robotics. I have something here for you to see, Jack. Well, he got your name right. How did he know it was your birthday? Well, I actually programmed it, and I hope perhaps he'd bake me a cake. <laughs> you going to introduce me to your friend? Uh, yes, I'd like to introduce you. Uh, hero, this is Jack Livesley. Jack, this is the Hero One, the Heath Company's new robotic training computer. Hello, Hero. Uh, can he understand what I say or hear what I say? Well, uh, not really, Jack, but I think we can try an experiment here. Here's a script. We have to pre-program this in. And now let me see if I can set this up. What are you doing here? Oh, okay. What's happening here is that this contains a microprocessor. It's still a micro, like any other computer we've looked at, because it has many more interfaces, more arms and legs and wheels and things and so on. But what I'm doing is I'm typing in the address of the next program I wanted to do, which is a little straight line for a joke that you have right. to tell there. Right, a little riddle here, all yeah. right? Hero, my grandfather drove a stagecoach that didn't have any wheels. How do you like that, Jim? Laughs at my joke. It's nice you can find somebody has the jack. I hate to tell you this. He didn't understand a word you said. He has no speech recognition. He can't hear sound, but he doesn't know what you're saying. I think I can demonstrate that by calling in. Yes, let's, uh, let's see what we can do here. We have a microphone in here that will recognize 2430 is the code, 24E0. And now moment, I'll ask it to recognize sounds, and we'll try rapping on the case of the computer, see if it can count the number of times we hit. Now, the microphone isn't terribly accurate. I'm not sure how this will work out, but here we go. Three. Well, I didn't oh, get sorry. that. Let's try it again. Five. No, that's a little ahead of right. One more. I'm I'll, afraid... It's always within two or three. Well, <laughs> okay. Uh, obviously, that state of the art isn't quite sufficient. Get, getting yet. back to its speech. Does it generate speech and music the way any micro computer does? The way well, it, it uses basically the same techniques. But one of the interesting things that it does here is it combines some of the principles of text used in music and phoneme used in conventional speech synthesis in order to be able to do things like sing, which is rather unusual with most computers. Is this, you know, what we might call an industrial robot? Uh, no, I wouldn't call it an industrial robot. What we have here, Jack, is a machine that 
doesn't have the strength. Most robot shoes in industry anyway tend to be bolted to the floor, tend to be very, very big things. They can pick up huge weights. This is just a little training robot for educational purposes. Jim, what else could it do? Well, let me show you some of the components here, Jack. If we turn it around, you can see on the front here is a sonar system which can tell the distance of objects by sending out brief sounds and recognizing how long it takes for the echo to come back. Here we have, for example, a light sensor, and we know that the speaker is on the inside of the head, and mm -hmm. so, of course, is a microphone that detects sound. Here, of course, we have the arm that will manipulate objects that will move up and down. The arm can manipulate arms. Now, yes, I think we that? can demonstrate that. Uh, it'll take a while to get this one in motion, but I think you'll see the arm. You mentioned working. the speaker. The voice is a low one, a male voice. That's why it's called the uh, right? Yes, they found that uh, speech was more easily recognizable with a low-pitched voice, and so that's why we call Hero him all the time and has a low voice. Well, it's coming over to see me. Maybe I you'd like to take the script? I think Cut it off the show. The opening time, okay. Wait till it closes its jaws there. There we go. Yep. Off it goes He's got the script, script Jim. We've got nothing else to say. Well, there's nothing for you to say, Jack, if you don't have a script. That I say will be best with a service as service. A message for Academy participants. At this stage of the Academy, you might want to consider joining a user's group. For a nominal fee, you can attend regular meetings, exchange computer programs and information, and get advice on both hardware and software. There are user's groups all over the province for almost every make or model of computer. Consult your Academy newsletters for more information. If you can't find a club in your area, why not start your own? For more information on how to do this, see page 12 of Newsletter 2. Guests in the studio are three people for whom computer music making is an everyday event. Fran Greer, who is an elementary school teacher, Bruce Mitchell, a musician and composer, and John Tucker, also a musician and composer. Jim, over to you and Fran. Hello, Fran. Okay. I see you have a Commodore Pet computer here. You have some kind of a musical interface on it? Yes, I do. Uh, I use uh, what's called a DAF for this program, which means digital to analog converter. Mm -hmm. And it's needed before it will convert the signals to a musical form to a stereo. That's all the interface that you need for music? Yes, it is. Uh, all uh, plus the stereo. Is there a census? No, it's not. It's very, very reasonable. This was homemade, this particular one, and it cost $10 to make. Okay. Now, you use computers in the classroom. Yes, I do. Can you show us how you do that? I, uh, what you see on the screen is a staff, and uh, we have to, to start the program, to, we have to put in a tempo which starts a marker and give it a uh, duration. And then we simply put in notes. It will mm -hmm. take up to four notes at a time, and I'll just very quickly demonstrate how to do that. Mm -hmm. If I put in a C, we have to separate all the notes by putting in periods, mm -hmm. an E, a D, and a C above middle C, and I show that by putting in a plus, mm -hmm. and giving it a duration. I say that, you will see it displayed on the screen. Now, it doesn't right. show the value of the notes, but it mm -hmm. does display where they would be shown on the staff. And uh, you can go on with this. And give it the same value. And if I put in another two. So you're putting in the, the actual notes that you want played? Yes, I am. And I can play it at any time by simply uh, pressing key to let you hear how this particular card, or these particular cards sound. Okay. I'll give it the same duration. I can hear what that sounds like by putting in the letter C. So those are the three chords. What do you teach your students by using this sort of enter? Well, they learn, they learn about chording and about harmony, too, obviously, uh, by playing around with it and experimenting. They also learn about the duration of notes and the, the values of notes and the relationship to one another. So they're learning quite a bit about music and do the they of music. Do they take the chords themselves? Yes, they do. Not when they start using the program. They would do very, very simple notes, just probably one note at a time. Mm -hmm. But the more they use it, they learn that different combinations make better sounds. And you also have fully uh, finished pieces of music, too. Yes, I do. Do you use that in teaching? Uh, yes, we use it a lot to accompany us in special special occasions, like uh, in plays or at school functions, or we use it for all Canada in the morning. And that sort of thing. Would you like to call it up and we can listen to it just a little bit? Yes, I will. Uh, has having a computer affected you the way you teach music? 
I find a lot, a lot of children are more interested in learning about music this year. They're not so inhibited. I've never had a student who particularly wanted to stand up and uh, sing a tune that they had composed this week. They're not inhibited using the program, and they, uh, they will experiment with it and will actually compose mm -hmm. using it. So is, this is music theory and not music practical, is it? Uh, yes. A little of both, really. Mm -hmm. there's, there's certainly we can hear what they're on. So here comes the music. This is showing what the computer, this particular program is capable of achieving. Okay, very good. One last question, Fran. How do you students feel about learning music on a computer? They love it. <laughs> very good. Thank you, Fran. We've seen a very simple and a very inexpensive interface to a computer. We'll look at something a little more involved now. Bruce, I see you have a rather elaborate Alpha Centauri system here. Okay. Yes, now this is a little more costly than the simple digital to analog converter. You have it on an Apple II Plus computer, I see. Mm -hmm. And this thing would cost perhaps in what order of price? Thousand. Why were you interested in machines like this? Well, I'm a composer. My main instrument is the piano, and mm -hmm. I see the computer as being an extension of uh, the piano, and uh, I can compose and assemble my musical ideas mm -hmm. uh, in the studio and uh, build up the, uh, my ideas that way using the computer. Can you give us an example? Okay, sure. Uh, what I have here loaded in the computer memory right now is a, a piece of bar talk. Um, that was originally a piano composition which I transcribed for the computer and this is what it sounds like. I'm fascinated by those little squares that appear on the screen. Do they have any meaning? Do you use those? I don't really use them. No. But they do mean something. Ah, uh, yes. Every, every note has its own color. Very good. Now, something like this is a pre-recorded piece of music. I gather you have quite a collection of music uh, on this and the apple here. Yes, I do. And do you use this collection of music for, for what? For your entertainment? Or? Well, I use it in uh, my own studio. Uh, I use it for the instrument to create sound and uh, supply uh, different sound effects in uh, AV productions and TV shows and so on. So do you use it as a player? Or as a composer, or exactly how? Well, as a composer, uh, I'll give you an example here. I'll turn what's off, uh, what's in there off, mm -hmm. and uh, you can play it as a regular keyboard, mm -hmm. and it has a number of sounds in it. Mm -hmm. I'll just go through them really quickly. Just by hitting a number, I'll get a different sound. And uh, for example, mm -hmm. it's using the keyboard here on the last system we saw, the input was through the computer keyboard. Here, the input is through the, um, the AVO keyboard. Uh, so if I want to record something, I just type R, and the uh, computer you know, will re remember everything that I play. Now uh, this is being recorded, as you know. Mm -hmm. Now once it's in there, I can manipulate it and uh, play it back and change the speed and the tempo, that kind of thing, and transpose it. Uh, I hit T for transpose, and as soon as I hit something, it's now transposed. And you can also... Oh, we can also speed it up, too. Mm -hmm. And you can also add to the music you've already recorded. Oh, yes, recorded. you can record over the top of the music as well. Here's the menu, uh, excuse me, uh, the menu for the, for the recording. It has a 16-track digital recorder mm -hmm. built right into it, Good. and we can record on track one like I just did now but then we can keep adding to it and adding to it. Is this the home instrument of the future? Is this what people will have in their homes, do you think? Uh, I think that a number of people will be more attracted to this kind of thing than, for say, you know, example, the home organ. Mm -hmm. uh, I still think that traditional instruments have a very important role to play in music. Mm -hmm. Okay, is there anything that this one's lacking that you wish it had? Does that have limitations of its own? Uh, yes, it does have some limitations. Uh, for example, voice capacity. You can only play eight notes at a time. Mm -hmm. uh, and also the frequency response of the instrument could be better, like the high end goes up to about 12,000 hertz. Okay, why would you use this instead of a regular instrument? What does it give you? It gives you different sounds, new sounds, sounds of the future, you create your own sound. Okay. And it gives you instant uh, feedback as to what you do on the keyboard. Very good, Bruce. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, we've looked at a intermediate cost machine. Now we'll look at something quite luxurious. John, uh, this is quite a uh, remarkable machine you have here. It's a Fairlight system. Fairlight system, yeah. 
This is Fairlight CMI. Now, we've looked at computers that have cost uh, less than $100 and perhaps a few thousand dollars. Is yours in the same price range? Or? It's approximately 10 times as expensive as the Alpha Centauri. So you'd have to be serious to want one of these? Yes, yes definitely. Okay, what we've previously seen are computers which are home computers which have things added. Is the Fairlight a home computer too? It's a computer-based system. Mm -hmm. um, it was designed specifically to be a music computer. Mm -hmm. And its software, although it does, will do your business and it will do word processing, is essentially music-oriented. Okay, now what, what do you do with it? I'm a composer and a musician. I do production work with it. Um, we have a studio. Um, we should get into the machine. Okay, why hand. don't we play some music? Okay. Good. What we're going to do is go to page R, which is essentially a rhythm sequencer. And this is the Fairlight going to play eight voices. And away we go. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we hear the disc going down there and cleaning the music in? Yes. And you can see each two bars as it passes. But this is instead, this is not a recording, this is really being synthesized by the this computer right now? Is what the Fairlight does is it digitally samples real instruments. So mm -hmm. it's playing basically fat sampled segments of real instruments back to you. It's not synthesizing them from scratch like the other systems. Okay, but how, how does it store these real instruments in its memory? It um, basically has a digital, analog to digital converter. Mm -hmm. Input can be through microphone, some tape. Uh, off a record even. You could so take so we, we saw what, the waveforms of the instrument? The waveforms. Okay, and yeah. what uh, it does is give you a three-dimensional waveform display. In this case, this is a sampled human voice mm -hmm. on keyboard three, which sounds something like that, Jim, and that's what it looks like. Sounds like somebody sounding, yeah. That's right. So this is really voice synthesis, too. This is, any, any natural sound can be sampled. Does this change your role as a musician when you're doing this sort of thing? It allows you an incredible amount of freedom in terms of sounds. You can access uh, a complete world of sounds that you would, you know, normally never be able to uh, even get near. Perhaps the other thing I can show since while mm -hmm. we're here is the, the segment. If we want to modify a sound, we, we take the light pen that. and just change the waveform. Okay, but John, I'd, I'd really like to see you as get back in, getting back into this producing music directly on the screen. Okay, we'll just set up a pattern here. Mm -hmm. What Pedro does is it takes these patterns and assembles them mm -hmm. in sections, and sections are assembled into songs. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we go back. Now we're going to create a section here. And So you have uh, a light pen. Up. Right. Now, what, what voice is this? This is a symbol voice. We'll just do something really simple here. And the symbol coming up. So there it is. And we'll put a bit of a back heat into it. And build up from here. Let's see what we can get. Yes, it is. And we can just put those voices in there. How do musicians react to a system like this? Well, uh, most of the people I deal with are completely blown away by it. And, mm -hmm. um, blown away how? Just amazed. And it's a matter really of working within the system, Jim. Um, in terms of replacement, for instance, I can't play the trumpet. Mm -hmm. I can write parts to the trumpet now. Mm -hmm. um, if I want the trumpet player to play them, I have them for him to hear. Mm -hmm. And we can do the back here now. This is quite wonderful. Uh, we, we, we really seem to have a whole orchestra here. And so this you use for composing, putting together, and creating music? Composing, it can be taken now, put on tape, and we could write more parts. That's we could put in the strings and put in the 
weird noises in the electronics. And, mm -hmm. all set. That's one of it. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you. Sir. Okay. Thank you, John. As Jim said, that was marvelous. It's not every time we have a full orchestra on the Academy. And thank you, Bruce and Frank. And Jim and I will be back to answer some of your questions right after this. Next on Bits and Bites, Billy Van and Luba Doy will show us the microcomputer in the workplace and how we use the two most popular programs for small computers, word processing, and physical. We'll even take a peek at printers and plotters. That's the next edition of Bits and Bites. And following it, Jack Lisley will be back with Jim Butterfield and guests for further exploration. The microcomputer in the workplace on Bits and Bites, followed by the Academy with Jack Lisley. All right, Jim, some questions from our viewers. On your last program, in your demonstration, you mentioned animation. Other than the sprites, you didn't show anything moving across the screen. How do you achieve that kind of motion across the screen? Oh, well, you generally move things across the screen of a computer by making it disappear from the place that it is and then reappear in a slightly different position so that as we do this regularly, things will move across the screen. I should point out that we don't just move graphics and figures and animals and things like that across the screen. You can move words or anything that you like to go across the screen. I have a little program here to illustrate this. If I type in run, then when I enter it, you'll see a word appearing near the bottom of the screen and it will be consecutively written in slightly different positions and you'll see it appear to move. It doesn't move, of course, it's just printed in new positions, but here we go. Can you see the word in motion? That's the general idea behind all kinds of motion. You just disappear it from one place and reappear it slightly moved. A little dance across the screen. Right. All right. Why are chips so cheap? When I buy a miniature TV set, it costs me more than the regular size. Well, when we manufacture these microchips, they're made in very great bulk. We make hundreds of them at a time. And so the manufacturing cost gets averaged out over the very large number of things that we do. It's much easier to make hundreds of chips at a time. Here's an example for the, of a silicon slice. This is actually how chips are made, and there are several hundred chips on this silicon slice, each one of which can be made into, in this case, a computer memory unit. You can see them all They're sitting there, and all you have to do when you finish manufacturing this slice is to cut the chips apart, and you have hundreds of chips to put inside their own little enclosure. That's what makes them inexpensive. All right, Jim, time for one more. What in the world is a string, and what does it have to do with computer programming? Well, a string is usually a piece of information which is not numeric. That is to say, we don't need to add or subtract it, and therefore we call it that. Usually the word string comes because the alphabetic letters or digits are strung together like beads on a piece of wire. So any time you don't need to add or subtract information, you'll probably use a string to hold that data. Thank you, Jim. That's all the time we have for now. Next time, Computers in the Workplace. This is Jack Lindsley with Jim Butterfield inviting you to join us then on The Academy.